All right. Thank you. Thanks. Let's let's go ahead and jump on in. We're in Hebrews chapter five. Uh, we just ended talking about approaching the, the God's throne of grace with confidence. Uh, such just amazing, amazing uh, information for us in our faith. In chapter five, verse one, he says, uh, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it as when it was call, as when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming the high priest, but God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. And and I'll stop there. Uh, you know, he, he, he he's introducing, we, we touched on it really lightly at the end of chapter four, and now we're going to, we're actually going to be talking about this next couple of chapters. Um, but Jesus, he talks about Jesus being the high priest, and he says, Every high priest selected from the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God. However, with Jesus, he's appointed by God. He's selected by God, appointed by God. And you remember I talked about being a pontifex, you know, that this is this is what uh, the Latin term for a priest, which is a bridge builder. Same idea. Pioneer, bridge builder. Um, this is one of the many titles that Jesus has uh, as high priest. He represents God to us and represents us to God, and he is there for us. And because of who he is, and he talks, he makes the analogy of the, the high priest normally, you know, these are men who are chosen by the people, and they make the sacrifices for the people, and the, particularly the big day, of course, is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the day that the high priest goes in and he makes the sacrifices for the people's sin. But he has to start out making his own sacrifice for himself. So he that's the first thing he has to do. All of this is in Leviticus 16. If you want to go back and look at it and understand it more and see what the high priest does, it's interesting. Um, but again, a high priest in Leviticus 16 is really just a foreshadowing of Jesus and his role as being the sacrifice for our sins. And, you know, there are several things that the Bible says are impossible in Hebrews. One of those is that the blood of lambs and calves will ever really eliminate our sins. Well, we know we have the greater high priest. We have Jesus because, of course, he does remove our sin. And But um, at the point he's making here is that uh, he is especially sensitive to us because, because he understands sin, because he understands the nature of sin. And um, and and that he doesn't he makes that point, but he also makes the point that no one takes this honor themselves, but is they're appointed by God. And in the same way, God appointed Jesus to be our high priest, to be our representative, to represent us. And Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming high priest, but God said to him, "You are my son. Today I become your father." And he says in another place, "You are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek." Um, and he kind of wraps up this thinking with uh, the the idea that he he where he is not like Aaron, you know. Typically, the high priests were the descendants of Aaron, right? Uh, you had to be in the lineage of Aaron to be chosen to be a high priest. But Melchizedek, if you remember, and we'll be talking about him even more, that he was the priest that he's a mysterious figure because we don't really know a lot about him. We know that Abraham gave him a tithe and and treated him as God's high priest. So Melchizedek, in a sense, was not a descendant of Aaron. He's long before Aaron. He's in the time of Abraham, not the time of Moses. Um, But he is God's chosen high priest. And so even Abraham, as great as Abraham is, he gives the tithe, he gives the offering to Melchizedek. And so... He says, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. In other words, appointed by God, not by the people. Okay, and then he shifts a little bit into focusing more on on Jesus and who Jesus actually is. And he says in verse 7, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, 
He offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. I mean, this is this is really an amazing scripture. It's it's absolutely remarkable because, I mean, here Jesus, and I remember I told you in the introduction that the book of Hebrews is amazing because it shows us both the deity of Jesus, the, the fact that Jesus is God and God in the flesh, but he also shows us the humanity of Jesus. And, and, he sh- and the book of Hebrews really explains both at a way that no other book does. And, and here he is, this is, we see the humanity of Jesus, that he offers up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. You know, that, that, you know, Jesus didn't just kind of waltz through life because he's God in the flesh and the Lord of all, that life was easy. No, he took on our burdens. He, he suffered with us. He went through it with us. You know, I think about, you know, that, that a lot of us that we, what many of us have served the poor in different places. And many of us have even gone to different countries and seen some of the poorest neighborhoods in Africa or Asia or Latin America or, or right down the road in Tijuana. And, and, and that was an amazing experience. Many people go through what, well, a term that's being used a lot now, but being awoke, you know, where, and I see it, I've seen it all the time. People, especially for the United States or Europe, they go to, to a country like this and we were running around the slum or the ghetto or the township or whatever it is, and they're just blown away. They're blown away that people live like this because their world is so different and they're ushered into a new understanding of, of the world. Now, what Jesus did is he didn't just visit us. He lived with us. He walked with us. He went through everything with us. He suffered with us and he carried our burdens. And that's why, you know, he, his prayers were with petitions and fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. You know, that, that he really like, typically what happens, we, we take groups or we'll go with a group and we go to these towns and, and ghettos and barrios and whatever it is. And we serve for eight hours and then we go back to our beautiful hotel, take a shower, sleep in a beautiful bed, have a wonderful meal in the restaurant and, you know, return back to our life. I mean, Jesus stayed there. You know, he stayed there. He spent the night there. He lived there. He didn't, he, he didn't just come for a few hours. He walked with us and which is the key to understanding, right? I mean, you want Everybody wants somebody to walk with them, to understand what their life is like, what their challenges are, what the burdens are, what their sorrows and their pains and the and the suffering that they go through. That's that's really kind of how you know somebody loves you because they're willing to walk through this with you. And that's what Jesus did. And it's amazing. I mean, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, crying and crying out. And and this is what he's going through and feeling. So he says, son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. You know, there's something that you, you learn about. It, you know, I, I say this a lot, especially when I'm teaching leadership courses, that uh, there's no better teacher than suffering. I mean, suffering teaches us a lot. Now, the truth is, it doesn't always teach people. It offers a lesson always. But sometimes people reject the lesson and would rather be withdrawn and angry and bitter. And so suffering can make you better or bitter. You've probably heard that before. But but that is the reality. When we suffer, we either get better or we get bitter. One of the two. If we learn from it, if we remain faithful through our suffering, we get better. We, We become more understanding. We become more compassionate. We become more sensitive. Honestly, we become more like Jesus because we're on the same path. You know, the, the, you've all heard the song Via Dolorosa. What Via Dolorosa means in Spanish is the suffering path, the path of suffering. And, and that is following Jesus. If, if we're not willing to suffer, we will never be able to follow Jesus because he will lead us through the valley of suffering. 
And honestly, you know, I've become more and more aware the older I get that helping people requires suffering. You have, it's not easy. It's not easy to help people. It's not easy to teach people. It's not easy to get people from point A to heaven, from wherever they are to heaven, because people can actually really hurt you. People can can not get it and turn on you and and you know all the stuff that I think about all the stuff that Paul went through as a leader and falsely accused and blamed and all this stuff that he went through and he was willing to go through it for God for the people and and that's just part of leadership part of leadership is you're willing to suffer you're willing to go through it a lot and I think that that the sad state in in in, in is that many people in our world, we, we, we don't want to suffer. We don't want to suffer at all. We want a pill. We're so used to just, if you start to hurt, take a pill and it'll go away. And in fact, if, if you can't take a pill and go, and it goes away, it's like something is terribly wrong. And, and in our society today, we think that nobody should suffer at all. And yet God allows us to suffer. And God allows suffering because we learn so much. We grow so much. And not that God wants us in suffering. He wants us to grow so that we won't suffer the wrong things. Because I think that, you know, I the way I look at it is there's redemptive suffering. And that's when you go through hard times and you learn from God and you grow and you come out better. And, and then there's just wasteful suffering. That's when we do stupid things and we suffer because of the stupid things we're doing. And that's not redemptive. <laughs> I mean, the only thing we can learn from that is that we're stupid and we need to repent. And and we there, there's wasteful suffering. There's just suffering in the world that doesn't need to happen, you know, and that's the wrong kind of suffering. But, but there is a suffering in helping people, in laying down our lives for others that is redemptive. It helps us. We grow, we learn, we develop, and we become more like Jesus. Unfortunately, our society is so anti-suffering that we we tend to reject all forms of suffering. And therefore, so when a relationship gets tough and you have to suffer, they just quit. People quit on the relationship. They just file for divorce and find someone else thinking that someone else is going to be good for them and they'll never suffer, you know, or and 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 I would say this, you know, having having some very close friends of mine who have gone through divorce and which is an intense suffering but have remained faithful and for them that suffering has been redemptive they grew because a spouse turned on them or a spouse did something to them and no fault of theirs but they ended up growing and becoming more like Christ because of it and and I've been very close to some people who've gone through that and seen how God has how they have become more like Jesus through it all and so Jesus suffered for us. He gave us his heart, his life, his devotion, and he, and he suffered through it. And that's what made him the perfect. That's why he is the perfect Savior for us. And he says, and it says because of his reverent submission, you know, rever- what is sub- reverent submission? It means that you submit yourself to suffering out of your reverence for God, because of God. You're willing to suffer. You know, if I keep, if I help this person, they may hurt me, but I'm going to help them anyways. Or they may not be grateful, or may, they may falsely accuse me, or they may turn on me, and yet you still are going to love them and serve to them and give them, give to them. And that is at the core of leadership, is that we serve and we even suffer, not because people are going to be thankful and and think we're great, everybody appreciates that, but because we love God. And whether or not people are thankful, whether or not people recognize it, even if people falsely accuse us, we will still serve, we will still love, even if they read the wrong intentions or just don't trust, that's fine. We love God, we're here, and we do what we do for God. That's what reverent submission is. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what was suffered and once made perfect. And of course, once made perfect. Now, this is a term that, again, is kind of striking because we think of Jesus always being perfect, right? He was he was who he is since before creation. Yet there was not, and we have to keep in mind that this is the Greek understanding of perfect, which is the word teleos, which is which is to be fully developed, not 
the English understanding of perfect, which means flawless. In the sense, Jesus has always been flawless, but he wasn't fully developed as a savior. He had to suffer so that he could be the perfect savior. He could be the, the savior that has compassion and understands everything we go through. So, so son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designed by God to be high priest in, in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so this, I mean, in a sense, Jesus' time here was part of God's development program for Jesus to be the perfect savior, to be the perfect high priest in the order of Melchizedek, the one that he appointed, the one that he wants, and and to, to represent us, to understand us, to have compassion for us, and that is Jesus, the great high priest. And we're going to come back to this theme, but again and again, you're hearing it that, that, that Jesus, he's just, he's perfect for us. He's, he is exactly what we needed. And then that ends and we jump into the third of the big warnings. I, mean, I told you there's five big warnings. There's some minor warnings as well, but the classic five we jump into now in the next paragraph, um, the, the, the warning against falling away, basically. And this is a big issue because why? Well, because a lot of people in the religious world are taught that you can never fall away, that once you're saved, you're always saved. And all that anybody really needs to do is read the book of Hebrews. And it's pretty clear that that is not a true teaching. That is certainly not the way the Bible looks at things. You can fall away. Uh, He wouldn't be warning us against it if it couldn't happen. Nobody's warning us against jumping up and flying in the air because it doesn't happen. But because falling away does happen, this is the third warning of the book of Hebrews. The whole idea of never falling away, once saved, always saved, it's a Calvinist teaching. It it ties into predestination, all this stuff that we don't have time to get into, we're not going to get into, but it hasn't been around that long. It's only been around for a few centuries. Um, everybody always understood before that you can turn your back and reject God and walk away from him. Anybody can. That's part of free will offering. That's part of giving our hearts to somebody. On any relationship, anybody can quit on a relationship. There's no, there's no chain that bounds two people together that's unbreakable. The fact is people quit on each other. And unfortunately, people quit on God. So here's the big warning. He says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. And this is a a very um, profound warning here. You know, he says, "We, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. If you've ever tried to explain something to somebody who doesn't want to hear it, you know it's impossible. You might as well be talking to a wall. You can't teach somebody that doesn't want to learn. You can't explain something to somebody who doesn't want to understand. It's why what's so important for harmony, for unity, for shalom, for health, spiritual health, we have to be seekers always. The the root word of, of, well, the Greek word for disciple um, mathetis, the you can hear as I say it, mathetis, math, mathematics. It sounds similar because it has the same root of learning how to think. Being a learner, a, a disciple is a learner, is somebody who's continually adding to their thinking, learning how to think. And that's what we're supposed to be doing, continually learning how to think, to think like Jesus, to think like God. You mean we can think like Jesus? Yeah, we can absolutely think like Jesus. It doesn't make us Jesus and doesn't make us God, but it but it does help us to know what is true, what is right, and and to be able to identify right from wrong and be able to 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 have the tools that we need to live a godly life. And so he gives this to us, but what happens is the human nature, and we all know this, is is when you get into something, whatever it is, you get into bicycling, you get into piano, you get into to any hobby, anything, what can happen is you start out with all this zeal and excitement, you buy everything, you're totally into it, and what can happen is after a while, you get bored with it, and then you plateau, and then you're not keeping up with it anymore, and then it's in the garage, and then it's collecting dust. Same thing happens with relationships. 
People fall in love and there's excitement, there's zeal, there's all this joy and excitement about it. You do everything, you know, you iron your shirt, you wash your car, you buy flowers, you do everything as a guy or the girl does everything and fixing yourself up and all this stuff. And, and then, but what's happening 10 years later? What's happening 20 years later? Are we still trying to be our best for each other? If you don't work at it, right? And you know, in relationships, you don't work at it. You get bored with each other and, and anger builds up and then you got all kinds of problems. This happens with people's relationship with God. They're so excited at the beginning. Everybody's excited. When people get baptized, oh my gosh, there's so much excitement. Everybody's excited. They're excited. They can't wait to read their Bibles. They can't wait to pray. Everything is seen through a new lens. Everything is wonderful and brand new. What about 10 years down the road? What about 20 years down the road? What about 30 years down the road? Are we still putting into that relationship? And here's the, here's the crazy thing. It is, it's a catch-22 if you're not excited, then you don't put time into it and you don't put time into it. Then the time that it takes to be excited, you're not putting in. So therefore you're not going to be excited. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. If you're not, not learning new things, there's nothing exciting happening. Your relationship gets bored, boring, and you drift away. And this is what he's saying. He said, you're not trying to understand anymore. You're not trying to learn new things. We need to always be pushing ourselves to learn, to grow. The, the, the word actually they, tra- they translate, try to understand, is, is nothros. It's, he's literally saying you've become slow, slow-minded. You become dense. You become, uh, 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 you know, we have a saying in Spanish, terco. You become stiff in your mind, that unyielding, unbending, no longer flexible. Kind of like when you think of when Jesus said, you can't pour new wine into old wineskins. We become crusty and inflexible. And we're not learning new things anymore. It always It's amazing to me how, because when we're learning new things, there's always somebody that's like, well, we didn't do that before, and that's not what was taught before, so why are you teaching that? You know, so We're supposed to be discovering new things about God and about how to be a Christian and about how to be a disciple and how to live out my life. Because the two things that are changing always is the world's changing around me and I'm changing. And so I got to keep growing and adding to what I have in my in my spiritual library, in my mind and in my heart, so I can keep up. And that's the warning. Don't do this. Don't let yourself become slow. He says, in fact, though, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God all over again. And here's, the, you know, we, we've heard this a thousand times, but it is true. If you're not moving forward, you don't just stand still. You start shrinking backwards. And then you become loose or vague or obtuse or weak in the basic things you knew at the beginning, in the basic knowledge you had once learned and were so solid on. And we have to go back to the basic elementary teachings to go all over again. He says, He says, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. You know, he says, basically, you can't handle it. You know, it's like since the the few good men line, you can't handle the truth anymore. You can't handle what is right anymore because your thinking has drifted back and your thinking, your brain is no longer filled with the spirit. It's no longer advancing in the kingdom of God. It's no longer fresh and new and exciting. It's boring. It's dull. And the things of God don't make sense anymore. It happens. It happens with relationships all the time. And this is the warning. You know, I mean, if we, if we see, a baby on, you know, drinking milk out of a bottle, we don't think twice about it, right? But if there, you saw somebody 15 years old drinking milk out of a bottle, you would say uh, that person has got some issues. They've got some serious problems. You know, they've got a, you know, the word would be arrested development, that their development stopped at some point. And even though they've been there around longer, they're not growing anymore. And this really frightens me about Christians when, uh, I think it can really happen after the 10-year mark. 
where you can be a Christian who's 25 years old and you literally know no more than you did when you were 15 years old as a Christian. You know the same. You have not advanced. And what happens? You start getting crusty and you start losing even what you had. Remember Jesus talks about in the parables that even what they have will be taken away from them. You know, the first time I ever read that, I thought, that's not fair. Those that only had a little had what they had taken away from them because they didn't use it, because they didn't produce the talent. Remember the one talent versus the five talent or the three talent, because the one talent buried his talent. And that's what happens if we just, if we're burying our knowledge or burying our, our Bibles and we're not like in there learning, growing, you know, I, I'm always pushing, pushing to learn more, to understand more, reading new books, commentaries. You know, there's all of us, if you've been a Christian more than 10 years, there should be books that you know really well. If you've been a Christian more than five years, you should be able to teach books in the Bible. You know, you'd be able to teach the gospel or teach, teach, um, whatever book you're into. I mean, different books call us and draw us to them. I'm mean, my favorite, as you can tell, one of my absolute favorites is the book of Hebrews. I know this book backwards and forwards. And it wasn't because um, I had to, it's because I want to. And it's it's causing me to grow and learn. You say, well, Robert, you're a Bible scholar, of course. But all Christians need to be growing and learning, adding to our faith goodness and knowledge and knowledge perseverance and and letting it finish its work so for what and this is all i'm quoting out of out of second peter chapter is it second peter yeah second peter chapter one verse uh three through ten that it keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive and that's one of the signs that we're not growing anymore we're not effective we don't know how to help people anymore or we're not getting better at it and unproductive we're not bearing fruit or we're not helping others bear fruit we're becoming fruitless. We're becoming a dead-end branch on the tree. No fruit, no growth, nothing. The tree's growing all around us, but we remain the same. And eventually, we fall off. We get we get pruned. So don't let that happen to you. Keep learning. Keep growing. Keep studying. I appreciate so many. I know there's, there's not a whole lot of people watching this right now. I'm, I don't know how many, but I would guess less than 15. I appreciate so much... Those of you that are in there watching, learning, growing. I mean, by the time you're done with this class, you can probably get up and teach a sermon on the book of Hebrews. No, you're not going to remember all of it, but you're going to remember a lot. And you're going to have a basic understanding of what Hebrews is all about. And you will have been through at least 13 classes. 14, if you count the introduction. I think there may have been more than one. Yeah, 14 classes on the book of Hebrews. I mean, that's it's 16 classes uh, if you took a 16-week course in a, in a college, you're learning. You're learning so much. And and the people who go back and watch the videos, and, and I'm not saying you're the only ones. There are other people studying in different ways. But I appreciate that so much because that's what, that's what it takes to grow, is you devote the time to keep learning, keep growing. And he says, solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. He gives us one of the clues. How do you keep growing? Well, one is by learning, yes, and continual growing and learning and studying. The other is by practice, by just practicing, that we're practicing what we're learning. What we learn, we go out and we practice it. The Bible says to forgive one another, we go out and forgive people. We think, okay, who do I need to forgive? All of us have a list. Who do I got to forgive? You know, uh, who do I need to love up on? You know, who do I need to who do I need to share the gospel with? Who do I need to to apologize to? You know, I mean all those things that's what keeps us growing and learning and and it says by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And you reckon and that's the thing is that when 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 you let's say you say something to somebody and you know you shouldn't have said that. And you know you hurt their feelings. And you think, okay, I need to apologize for that. And if you don't apologize, it sticks with you. It's like gum in your brain that just, mm, 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 it's taking you back. When you go and you apologize to that person, it sets you free. And you're, you're, you're free. You learn something. And here's the funny thing is, the next time somebody says something to somebody and they don't apologize, you recognize it. You know exactly what's happening in that person's brain. 
they are getting stuck. Why? Because you dealt with it. Sometimes people want to know, well, how do you know all this stuff about people? Because I got to deal with my sin all the time. And the best way to learn of how to deal with sin is dealing with your own sin. You know, I, I, I've got to be humble. I have to apologize. I have to be, I have to be pushing myself to learn and grow and change and develop and become more like Jesus and love better. And, and, and here's the thing is, I don't want you to think it's like dreary where it's exciting. I'm becoming more and more like Jesus, not leaps and bounds. And I'm not, you know, I'm not super Jesus, but I'm growing and learning continually. And here's the thing is, is that if you just have, if you have a half hour quiet time every day, you spend a half hour, that's not a lot. Finish 15 minutes reading, 15 minutes praying, and you do that for a year, for a year, let's say five days a week. I mean, that's 250 quiet times. That's 125 hours in the Bible. You do that for 10 years. You've spent 10, what is that, 1,500 hours in the Bible. Anybody spending 1,500 hours in the Bible is going to learn a lot of Bible. They're just going to know a lot about the Bible. You know, you do that for 30 years. I don't, you know, I'm not a mathematician, so my math might even be off. But, but, but you know what I mean. It adds up over time, and you learn so much. And he, and he goes on to say, I'm going to read the first part of chapter 6 because it, it's connected. It's a, really probably the chapter should have broke after chapter three. That the, God didn't put the chapter breaks in there. People did. So chapter six, verse one, he says, therefore, let us move beyond. Okay, therefore, what's the therefore? What's it there for? It's because he, what, what he was just saying about the importance of learning and growing and not becoming thick, not becoming slow. He says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and to and be taken for excuse me elementary teachings my bible's missing that section i started reading the page behind it about Christ and be taken forward to maturity not laying on again the foundation of repentance and it might, my it's missing the section so i'm going by memory here uh, be taken forward to maturity not laying on again the foundation of repentance and acts that lead to death but faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. You know, he's saying we we just we got to keep moving forward so we don't fall back into the basics again. So we don't stay in kindergarten when we're 15 years old, when we're 20 years old, that we keep moving forward. The world needs more Jesuses. The world needs more people who know how to love, who know how to forgive, who know how to how to be a light, to know how to help others. So it is important what we do. People ask all the time, "Why? what is God doing? Why doesn't he do something? I always tell them, well, he did. He sent you. I mean, we're, we're all, we are God's rescue plan. We are the fire, we're the first responders. We're the we're the Coast Guard. We're the Fire Department. We're we're the ones that are supposed to rescue and help others. Is it possible for us? No, but it's possible for Jesus in us. But we just have to be continually growing and being more and more like him, which means we have to live in reverent submission, just like Jesus, that we submit ourselves to learning and growing. Don't let yourself fall into stagnation or guarding what you have alone, or holding down the fort mode, or or just I'm hanging in there mode. Push ahead. Keep growing. Be more like Jesus today than you were yesterday. Be more like Jesus this year than you were last year. Be Certainly be more like Jesus. Know the Bible better. Memorize scriptures. Study out books. Buy commentaries. You want to know what commentary? Email me. I'll tell you what commentary to buy with with whatever book. In IPI, we have we have a lot of great teachers now in our fellowship that are writing commentaries on books. Just recommended a great commentary on the book of Matthew by Steve Kennard. He wrote a great one, you know. Obviously, I wrote a book on the book of Hebrews, John Oaks and I. And and there's there's more. There's a lot more up there. Uh, Gordon Ferguson wrote a great commentary on the book of Revelation. 
Um, and I think you wrote one on Galatians too. And so there's, there's, there's great commentaries. And then of course you have the scholarly ones. There's, there's lots of ways to keep growing and learning. Memorize scriptures. Those, the word of God is your shield. It's your sword. It's, it's your way to defend yourself and advance the light and to change the world around you. Those are your weapons. Those are your tools to make change inside you and around you. But we got to approach it that way and go after it and, and become the real superheroes, you know, and have our powers. You know, you what are your superpowers? Let me tell you something. <clears throat> the Bible is a great superpower. Knowing scriptures and living by them and being devoted to them. Uh, knowing Jesus and being confident in him, being filled with the spirit and led by him. And how do we know that we're being led by spirit? Well, because we live according to the scriptures. That's how we know, because they are in perfect sync, in perfect harmony. So so that's basically what he's saying. I want to end it. I'm going to end this. We'll stop right there. But I do want to end this with, um, with I just want to read this because I, I quoted it earlier. Uh, just roughly, but I want to read it. I want to quote it properly. Um, this is Second Peter. I don't usually do this, but this is such a good, this is such a great complimentary scripture to what we're reading right here. He says, Second Peter 1 verse 3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil, desi evil desires. You see what he's saying? He's saying that God's power is used to help us to change, to grow, and to participate in the divine nature. That means to be like God. And, and, and he says, and escape the corruption of the world. I mean, the world is so corrupt and evil with greed and selfishness and pride and, and all this junk. It helps us to get out of that. He says, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. You know, so I love this chapter because, or this, this, this paragraph because he explained so well the importance of moving forward. You know, the two things that we're warned about, not, not getting thick, not, you know, that we keep learning, we keep growing, that we don't get stuck, you know, that we don't let ourselves stop growing, keep learning, keep growing. And the two things that, in the two areas he talks about, in our knowledge and in our practice, you know, that we're learning lots of things and that we're practicing it more and more, better and better. And it keeps us from being ineffective and unproductive. So I appreciate those of you who could tune in this morning. I appreciate all those that you couldn't tune, but you watch it later and you watch it when you can. And thank you for pushing yourself forward and growing and growing and growing. And God bless you. Thank you for joining us. I hope this has been educational and inspiring for you. If you'd like to know more, please join us by going to study.laicc.net and we'll be happy to contact you and help you in any way we can.